the Social Security Administration to privatize and um, move away from the current pay-as-you-go program towards one where those funds are privately invested. And he's pointed out that the real cap stock is twice what we thought it was, and hence there are two different margins along which to spread those new uh, loanable funds. And uh, I, I guess the first question I have is, have I, is that a fair assessment of part of what you're doing, or how can you comment on that? I'd say it's a pretty good summary. <laughs> we need more savings opportunities. Um, by the way, I'd like to thank the benefactor or the late uh, of this uh, lecture. Um, I think our financial system, except for a small part, is very good in getting better. The channeling of investment, savings to investment, a lot less resources are being used. You can insure against idiosyncratic risk almost for nothing. Um, that's Transactions are so much faster now and uh, secure. Um, so I don't, I thank the bankers <laughs> and other people, the asset management companies, for having improved the system significantly. Um, with their innovations. Thanks, Ed. I'll ask one more question, and then we'll turn it over to the students uh, and other professors. Uh, Ed has been instrumental in developing what we call the computational experiment in macroeconomics. And this is where we uh, build a mole where individuals make decisions. We aggregate those decisions uh, into a macro economy, and then we, we use that model to um, to uh, help us better understand the past economic data, to help us better understand um, uh, current policy. Ed, uh, having been part of a team that developed the computational experiment, where, where do you see that going in the future? Um, will the computational experiment continue to be the mainstay of macroeconomic, of what we do as macroeconomists, um, or how do you see that evolving? The short answer, Yes. You look at what happened in the uh, engineering. Uh, it's 80% where they do these create computer models of phenomena. About 10% of that activity is uh, experimental, where they put the weight in the beam and see where it breaks by the shape and as a boat. But some things you can't run by experiments, like the modular landing on. Uh, Mars, or things go out of the wind tunnel range. The other 10% is the theoretical uh, language development. Uh, but the total dominating group is it's sort of like engineering, it's a parallel. The big difference between engineering and physical engineering and uh, economics is we have something more complicated in our model than particles. We have people. <laughs> Uh, and let me ask a question uh, as well. This is an extension of, of, of this paper, uh, and you may not have had a chance to get into this yet, but uh, uh, the U.S. is relatively well positioned with its high birth rate uh, relative to other countries. Utah is particularly well uh, positioned in that regard. We have the highest birth rate in the nation. But in a country like Japan, where you've which you have studied uh, carefully as well, where they have declining uh, birth rates, or in Italy, where they have actually negative birth rates, which is where you and I first met for the first time, uh, what's the challenge to them uh, as it relates to the insights that are coming out of the, the, the model that you have? Certainly, they have intangible capital stock as well. And you, Certainly haven't had a chance probably to extend this study carefully in those areas. But if you were just to speculate, what would you say? Well, I was just in Taipei, which has the lowest birth rate. Um, some people are going to get hurt. Everybody goes to college there. And they were telling me there's going to be a big excess supply of colleges. <laughs> but um, I think, but they're high tech and they're developed, they're multinationals. I just, Let's see, Delta I was the one company that I went to visit and uh, talk to the people and just the technological advances being made with those beautiful 3D 
um, TV where you don't need glasses. Um, that's coming and coming pretty soon. And on the solar, my wife Jan told me we're going to get solar energy pretty soon. <laughs> and I asked him, the guy there, the how much, how close is it? It used to be a factor of 10 or something with coal. Now it's a factor of two. It's one of the key inputs came down by a, just these technological innovations in the in the light bulbs, energy consumption is. But you got to have that high tech, and you got to be integrated with the rest of the world. And the things that they develop is helps us, and in the process of helping us, they're helping themselves. I don't, as the world as a whole, um, I think population is going to stabilize at, a, at maybe eight billion or nine eight. Roughly, um, I think societies will figure out ways to do that. Japan's a pretty congested place, but it's becoming less so. The working age population shrinking. Of course, we can make people work for longer uh, and retire later, which is one dimension of margin that we're just learning things more about. And as we see different arrangements set up in Europe, between countries and, and differences in the behavior. Uh, there's so many puzzles in the labor supply area. Poland, we see that they work more, the full-time workers work more hours than we do. Um, What's that up they, to now about, do you know? I, less than 2,000, 40 hours, yeah, we're 1,800. 1,800. Um, but they work a, sh a smaller fraction of their lifetime. But they're going to reform that, and I think, I think we can handle that with this more capital and this technology capital expanding uh, and setting up. We want to set up better taxing regimes. We want to think through and work through and not worry about these little fluctuations and what little gimmick for today. We want to design a good system that will serve us well, that people know is going to be followed in future years. Um, a lot of people say that this Lars Hansen and Tom Sargent are likely may be blessed on Monday <laughs> when the Nobel Prize is announced. And as you know, Lars is a graduate of this institution. Uh, Sargent has the most beautiful ex example of France is in terrible fiscal shape in the 20s. With the, it was, the spending was totally out of control. This is Pantcaré's regime. They got together and they agreed to it, uh, reforms. And good things started happening even before the reforms were made. And they followed through and they honored them and that was great for uh, France. So what happens now depends upon what you think is going to be, going to be done in the future. Uh, don't try and use causality to say when this action was taken policy action was taken and what happened. It's the regime that people expect to be followed that matters. That comes out of the, the work of Lucas, critique, and the Finn and my rules rather than discretion. I, I remember, I, I'll just take one other comment. Uh, I remember uh, uh, reading some work that uh, to this point it said that as the Smoot-Hawley tariff was being considered in Congress, even in the process, long before it was actually voted on and signed into law, but as it was working its way through Congress, already you began to see the effects that that was having on the real economy. Let's take it, uh, open up and take questions from the audience. Yes. Point seven was the number. That's the easy part of the question. I look at some societies, like the Greek. <laughs> they're they're pretty limited, and it would be lower for Argentina. But then I look at some countries like Singapore that had, it's up there around two, um, in Japan. Now, these societies have well one. You're the political scientist, aren't you? 
<laughs> he was, that's, we don't have a good theory in economics and we're relying on the political scientists. Other questions? Yes. Based on your work, uh, what is your opinion on whether the Bush tax cut should be extended or allowed to expire? I say to tax, I'm sorry, to spend is to tax. So I say cut expenditures and keep the, and actually do not increase taxes. Uh, you say expired. Uh, if anything, cut them. Um, you can cut some things in some ways by that shifting from um, tax and transfer to mandatory savings. Uh, even though it may look the same for your paycheck, um, but then you look in that little note on how your balances in your savings account are going up. Academ we academics are uh, were pioneers in setting, under Andrew Carnegie, setting up TIA and CREF, which are effectively dictated by, it would be crazy not to participate in these. Uh, so this, and this provides for retirement, financing of retirement. Uh, I think we got to design, you can get everything from the, that the social welfare state provides, but with better financing arrangements that have, don't have the huge dead weight loss. This is very late in my life that I became an expert in public finance after teaching the undergraduates and giving them some fun exercises and being surprised by what they reported using the models that well, a lot, first the real business cycle and then this overlapping generation. This came out of teaching honors students at the undergraduate level was the origins of this. Um, the old in institution, so, um, but I, by the way, to, to tax is to depress, and so I think the only thing is to cut expenditures and let groups of people do things as locally as possible, and if we in our community want something, we, we get it. We spend and get it. Uh, if, it's worth, if the value exceeds the cost, not having uh, some centralized authority managing Utah State, uh, that'd be, or your business school, <laughs> that would be tough. I should note that the provost is sitting here in the back row, so thank you, provost, uh, for coming and attending. And Thank you for that political plug there. Uh, uh, other questions? Yes. Could you speak up just a bit, John? I'm not sure everybody in the back can hear. I, I wonder how much difference it would make to have the district uh, we, we think it makes a big difference. Well. It's good to have people working on different things. Uh, my student who graduated last year, I guess he's over in Rome now, Boris Rubini, it's, I'd asked him what is, are they equivalent or not? And uh, he's been pushing the econometrics of this. The trade things seem to be saying, with the monopolistic competition, saying uh, you calibrate or even the different factor endowments, which are competitive, by the way. If you calibrate to the total trade flows, they all seem to give roughly the same answer. There's small gains from openness, theoretically, for whether you use Krugman's increasing returns or uh, um, Eaton and uh, Cordham, or go back to the Hexer and Lynn different factor endowment. Uh, they all seem to give small. With our technology capital, we about triple that uh, gains, but it's still about a third, needs a factor of three. And people are now working on diffusion of knowledge. When you're in proximity with smart people, you benefit, or people that know about these things, that's what we have. There's a lot of diffusion. That's why you see, I think, 
clusters like Silicon Valley type things where you lose not information or rivals get information from you, but you get information from them. At the, and this enhances the productivity of both operations, yet you don't get the full return on your investment in creating that, but you get the, some of the returns on your neighbors. Now these are, um, Lucas is by the way working on the flow of ideas and he emphasizes the importance of cities and having that interaction. Um, that whole, that's getting into the development side. Um, and by the way, competition is, seems to be so important, yet I don't have a good, empirically we see it being so important, yet we don't have a way to bring that in formally, though we're trying to. Um, Holmes and McGratton are trying to get that diffusion, um, which to amplify that gains from openness. We have time for just one or two, maybe more questions. Yes. I'm trying to make it The Supreme Court in 1957 ruled that uh, Social Security is not government debt promises. Um, Social Security benefits have been cut dramatically in the U.S. Um, when, I can mention three, the Greenspan Commission of 83, where they started taxing half the benefits. In the early 90s, it, they jumped it to 85% for people above certain levels. Uh, the Boskin, well, what you index, the price, the price index, getting a better price index, it's correct, the benefits are indexed to inflation. Our CPS overstates the amount of inflation. So they made some reforms, changes there that reduce that. They could do a lot of things to reduce that and say nobody gets it if they've saved for retirement. Uh, if it's, some of these have create perverse incentives if they do do that. Um, will, I, overnight you can switch to the, the Australian type system and honor all those promises made to the people, um, the current retirees and the people that have contributed about to retire. Um, it's, But we have to have people becoming, thinking more about this and, and working things out and having the public discussion, hopefully coming to a consensus in the country and then instituting a better system to better serve us so that you won't go hungry when you're old. We need to come to the end of the hour. Uh, some of you didn't catch the reference uh, to the uh, uh, announcement that we may be made next Monday about the new Nobel Prize winners. We don't know who those are. Uh, the professor, uh, Pre Prescott, mentioned Lars Hansen. Lars uh, was once seated where you are uh, as a student here at Utah State University. He's now a professor at the University of Chicago. Uh, after he graduated here with his undergraduate degree, he got his PhD from Minnesota, an institution where uh, Professor Prescott was uh, employed for many years, and uh, after he finished that degree, Professor Prescott was uh, notably uh, uh, significant in attracting him to Carnegie Mellon, where he was uh, at that time located. So we don't know whether Lars Hansen will uh, get the Nobel Prize or not. His father, by the way, was uh, provost uh, while he was here <laughs> as an undergraduate. Uh, but stay tuned to that, and also stay tuned to the continuing work uh, Professor Ed Prescott, won't you join me in thanking him for this <laughs> important lesson? Thank you. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Now we need to move out as quickly as we can because there's another class coming in. Dan, thank you so much for joining us.